You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, pending some kind of... What the heck is going on with my microphone here? Sorry, it's going to get louder. There we go. Pending some kind of uh, cataclysmic earth-ending event, um, this is the final day. We're going to get through all three teams that we have not covered yet. So technically on the schedule, we have the Giants, the Buccaneers, the Panthers, the Vikings, and then the Bears. We've already covered the Vikings and Bears. So Monday night game, following a Sunday night game, which we talked about uh, yesterday, the Kansas City Chiefs, we've got Monday night, December 11th, New York Giants at 7.15 p.m. on ABC. After that, we have a regular old noon game on the road against the Carolina Panthers. And then another night game, Sunday night at Minnesota, 720, followed by Chicago Bears at whatever time. TBD. Actually, some of these also might be TBD. I don't know. The schedule is going to shift a little bit. They're going to change some stuff. But uh, why don't we go ahead and just get statted? So the New York Giants, as I said, uh, also were a very fraudulent team last year. They weren't as fraudulent as the Minnesota Vikings, largely because their record didn't really reflect um, anything massively positive. But they went 9-7-1. They were one of several teams. When, When the Packers went through their rough stretch, one of the other really weird things that was going on is a lot of the teams that beat up on us started really hot. The Giants beat us 27 to 22 in week five. And our thought was, man, we got beat by a garbage team, the New York Giants. Well, they kind of are a garbage team, but they started six and one. They ended nine and seven. That means they went three and six down the stretch and then went into the playoffs. Then somehow beat the Minnesota Vikings because the Minnesota Vikings are actually that big of frauds. They were that bad. A team that, that had barely won any football games, one of them being the Houston Texans, big frickin' deal. Then they, well, technically they were nine, well, I said nine, seven, and one. They, they tied the Washington Commanders. Then they beat the Commanders, BFD, and then they beat the Colts. Probably down the stretch, I mean, I, there's only so many worse teams in football. The Bears are one of them. The Vikings certainly were one of them. The Colts, absolutely. The Texans, definitely. But, I mean, the Colts were in that line. They didn't beat anybody really relevant, but they sure did beat the Vikings, didn't they? Then they went and played a real team, the Philadelphia Eagles, and beat, got beat 38-7, to just to kind of illustrate how absolutely garbage they actually were. Now, the conclusion of the season, they had the 15th-ranked offense, the 17th-ranked defense. That says mediocre, but so does 9-7-1. and But the, again, the idea being they started off really hot and ended terribly. But um, that, that entire team had a year one coaching staff and actually when the when the team got started off to a real hot start it's like see brian dayball son coming over from buffalo he really turned this team around mike kafka dan martindale i mean it was it was actually kind of a you know they brought over wink martindale from baltimore and it's like man they really got a great coaching staff and they got this thing locked and loaded and ready to go and then it just imploded let me read you a little snippet about the giants this is a Quote, and again, this comes from Sharp Football. He puts together a big uh, preview of the teams going into 2023, or the, the, the NFL season, I guess you could say. Quote, this is a quote from within. Not at any point, not in any season, for the last five years did the Giants have a winning record. They are the only team in the NFL to not have even one week in any season where they sat above 500 in the last five years. End quote. That's what I wrote last in last year's Giants chapter. The Giants were left in an utter state of despair, uh, disrepair by former GM Dave Gettleman. As of February 20, uh, 2022, the Giants had the fourth lowest cap space of any team in the NFL. Which, by the way, when you are a... Well, I'll, I'll read the next line too. They, they also had the ninth most snaps to replace in free agency. When you've never had a winning record, and I don't just mean by the end of the season, I mean, as he said, at any point... In any week over the last five years, this is not including 2022, obviously, and you have no money, and you've got a bunch of free agents going out the door, that just shows your GM is completely inept, which is terrible because 
70% of fans could do a better job. I shouldn't say that. That's not true. I think most fans love the way Dev, Dave Gettleman does things. Just go out and get a bunch of free agents and, and just big swings, baby. Let's say at least 25% of fans can do a better job than what Dave Gettleman did. Maybe a higher percentage of Packer fans because we understand the way Packer fan, the, the, the way the Packers have done things. But how pathetic. You have a terrible football team and you're employing sort of this all-in strategy, spending way too much money on free agents when you can't even win football games. Bro, you got to build up the core of your team. What are you doing? It goes on to say, and they had the extremely rare situation in which their starting quarterback and starting running back were highly drafted, but so questioned that both were in line to play out their rookie deals and leave in free agency as neither had their fifth-year option picked up. Of 30 quarterbacks with 1,000 attempts uh, attempts from 2018 to 2021, Daniel Jones ranks between number 25 and number 30 in virtually every common metric, including completion percentage, yards per attempt, passer rating, and touchdown-to-interception ratio. In more advanced metrics, he also ranks 29th in EPA per attempt, 29th in success rate out of those 30 qualifying quarterbacks. Understandably, ownership had no interest in extending him, Um, but this was the hand Brian Dable was dealt. So... Clearly, a lot of this has to do with the complete disaster that they were left with. So it's it's new GM, entirely new coaching staff. So it's understandable that it's going to take some time. It's just a little bit odd that they got off to such a hot start and then completely imploded. (laughs) It's funny, though, because it says they won week one, and that was the first time in the past six years they had a winning record when they were were 1-0 to start the season. Wow. He also goes on to say that last year, despite the fact that they kind of imploded, at no point did they have a losing record. So, you know, making strides, making copies. The heck is that from? Something stupid, I think. Um, the Giants actually did cover the spread, a.k.a. exceed expectations in 13 of the 17 games. He seems to like that metric. I don't necessarily. Because if you look at their record, you can see that they weren't a really good team. If you look at their um, uh, point differential, you can see they're really not a very good football team. If you look at exceeding expectations, that's fine. But it it might just mean that the expectations were too low. But if the expectations are you're a two-win team and it turns out you're a six-win team, I'm still not impressed by you. It just means people thought too low of you because you've been garbage for the last five years. It's nice to say the the Giants are better than what people thought, but that doesn't help me to understand who you are. How good are the Giants? Better than people think. Okay, what, what do people think? I don't know what you're talking about. Does that mean they beat everybody? No, they lost a lot. But people just thought they'd lose by, like, more points. They thought they'd lose by 10. They only lost by 7. Boom. Exceeded expectation. boy, Brian Dable. But anyways, let's take a look at uh, what has changed with the New York Giants. Because obviously a big part of this, you know, when, when somebody takes over a team, they try to kind of do away with some people and bring in some people that fit what you do. But it's, it's a process to do that. It's going to take a while. So this is year two of sort of this... I guess you would call it a rebuild. I don't know if that's actually what they're doing, but at least rebuilding it in the image of the new coaching staff, right? You've got Wink Martindale trying to build a Martindale aggressive attacking defense and Dayball doing his old Buffalo Bills shtick over there. But starting with people that they are losing, Kenny Galladay is going bye-bye. That was one of the bigger disasters. They paid him a massive amount of money. He was fantastic with the Detroit Lions. I think everybody, including myself, assumed that that was a good signing. Turns out it was not super great. Kenny Galladay, who was once considered a premier receiver in the NFL, was the Giants' number seven receiver, tied for seventh with uh, David Sills, who, by the way, only played nine games. Kenny Galladay played 14 games. He had 17 targets, six receptions, which is the lowest reception number of any wide receiver. Six receptions, 81 yards, and a touchdown, 55 PFF grade, 54.7 receiving grade. What the heck happened to Kenny Holiday? Anyways, he's out the door, as well as Marcus Johnson, who was the number five receiver. So no real big losses there. Darius Slayton, Richie James, Isaiah Hodgins, uh, Wandale Robinson, Sterling Shepard. These are their top guys. And then in the additions column, they brought in Paris Campbell, $4.7 million. They brought in Jamison Crowder for $1.3 million, and then they drafted Jalen Hyatt out of Tennessee. So presumably these are pretty big upgrades at wide receiver. And I don't necessarily mean pretty big as far as like elite um, big swings, but you're cutting out two of your lowest wide receivers, bringing in 
two guys that presumably fit what you're trying to do a little bit better, as well as, again, Jalen Hyatt, the speed guy. And then they also added tight end Darren Waller. Now, that's a big question mark. They got him in a trade, and they got him for cheap. And uh, obviously, again, the reason being the guy's got some off-the-field struggles and whatnot going on, but we all know his ceiling is quite high if they can kind of get that working. Um, quarterback situation obviously is the same running back situation is largely going to stay the same. They got Saquon Barkley followed by Matt Breida. And then, uh, they do have a guy by the name of Gary Brightwell. Doesn't look like they've gotten rid of anybody, but they also added Eric Gray out of Oklahoma in the fifth round. So not going to make that big of a difference. Saquon's going to be their guy. Offensive line, um, left tackle, Andrew Thomas, one of the best offensive linemen in football, left guard, Ben Bredesen. Pretty subpar football player, 61 PFF grade, run blocking, 53 pass blocking. Looks like he's still there. They did move on from John Feliciano. He went over to the 49ers. Um, Again, subpar football player, but at least a little better as a pass blocker, 55 run blocking compared to 66 pass blocking. Um, But he's out the door. And interestingly enough, the backup center, Nick Gates, is also out the door. He was very similar, 58 run blocking, 69 pass blocking. So the the starting center and backup center went out the door. However, they drafted in the second round John Michael Schmitz out of Minnesota. So presumably he's going to step right in day one and be the starting center. And I really don't have a ton of confidence in rookie second round centers. Maybe eventually, but I I don't think that that's going to be super great. Uh, Mark Lewinsky is their right guard, another terrible pass blocker. Looks like pending some kind of a competition going on, he's going to stay there. And then Evan Neal, who, um, man, oh man, you want to talk about disappointing. I mean, I know Packer fans throw hissy fits when people draft whoever they don't want or whatever based on what the experts say. The experts said Evan Neal was going to be an elite football player, and maybe he'll get there. He was picked number seven overall. He had a 41 pass blocking grade. 48 run blocking, 42 pass blocking. He gave up eight sacks, 10 hits, 34 hurries, 52 pressures. This might have been the worst tackle in all of football last year. So they have an elite left tackle. They have a very subpar interior with one question mark at center and maybe the worst tackle in football in Evan Neal. Maybe he takes a step, but I mean, if he takes a slight step, he's still going to be terrible. And they really didn't do anything to upgrade this offensive line at all, aside from, again, drafting John Michael Schmitz out of Minnesota. Everything else stays the same, and that's kind of a disaster. Then when we look over at their defense, top two guys, Dexter Lawrence and Leonard Williams, very, very solid interior guys, especially Dexter Lawrence. He had a 92 PFF grade. He might have just become one of the best defensive tackles in football. Leonard Williams also still doing a fantastic job. Um, Justin Ellis, who is a terrible defensive lineman, is now gone. Uh, He is still a free agent. They also uh, got rid of Nick Williams, who went to the Chargers. He was a subpar interior guy. And they got rid of Henry Mondo, who went to the Jaguars. He had a 29 PFF grade. He was horrible. So, I mean, they, they only have horrific defensive linemen outside of their top two, which is a problem because, you know, you got to rotate these guys in. But they got rid of several and brought in a few. Namely, Ashawn Robinson, number one. He would be sort of a mediocre football player, I guess. If you had to, if you told me to guess what his PFF grade would be, I'd say it's about a 65, which is what it was last year, playing for the Rams. Spent four years in Detroit, by the way, if the name sounds familiar. But again, that's a big upgrade over what they've had in the past, or what the, the, the guys they got rid of. So this is a, a decent, steady, solid number three guy. Better run defender than pass rusher, but you've got your pass rushers and your first two guys. Then they brought in uh, Rakim Nunez Rochez, who had a 56 PFF grade. But again, I think it's still probably a slight upgrade. He's kind of a 50 to 60 PFF guy. And then in the seventh round, they got Jordan Riley, which who cares about a seventh round defensive tackle. Off the edge, their top guy, Kayvon Thibodeau, had a 72 PFF grade, had a pretty solid rookie season. But that's really about it. I don't think anybody else even had a, well, Quincy Roche had a 67 PFF grade. That's the only other guy that was even in the 60s. And as far as I can tell, they did zero things to add to that group. They didn't lose anybody. They didn't add anybody. So, I mean, maybe some of these other guys can grow a little bit or Kayvon can take another step. I don't really know, but um, there's really, really nothing here. And even Quincy Roche, I just realized he didn't even play. That's based on six snaps. So scrap that. Um, Aziz Ojolari. 
He was a second-round pick. He's going into year three, but he only played a half a season. He's never even cracked a 60 PFF grade. Um, yeah, it's same. Yeah, Roche was in his second year also. Scrapped the second year because he played two games, six snaps in those two games, and in his first game, uh, first season, he had a 59 PFF grade. So it's it's a very weak edge group, and so the defensive line is solid if you just look at the first two guys. So if it's the starters, you got two really good interior guys, Kayvon, who's solid, and then kind of a nobody on the other side. That's still a good group. But as you start to rotate, it gets real thin, real weak, real fast. At linebacker, they had absolutely nobody last year. They had uh, Jalen Smith was their top guy. As we know, he can't do anything. 56 PFF grade. Um, And then they had Micah McFadden was their number two linebacker, 38 PFF grade. And then Jared Davis, 58. Well, not surprisingly, they got rid of Jalen Smith, and then they added in Bobby Okerike, who has been a long-standing player for the Indianapolis Colts for the last four years. Very, very up and down player. I mean, week to week, and one <laughs> literally, if you just look at this stretch here from week nine, 97, 53, 54, 29. He ended with a 73, but man, on a on a week to week basis, you have no idea what he what he, he's going to give you. 80, 50. 67, 49, 74, 82, 67, 97, 53. I mean, he's just wildly inconsistent. Even year to year. His rookie year, he had a 78. Year two, 47. Year three, 58. Year four, 73. So I I don't know what to tell you other than there's he at least has the potential to be a good linebacker, but they still have a rough linebacking situation. Uh, then when you look at their cornerback situation, number one corner, Fabian Moreau. He really didn't perform very well, um, and they actually let him go. He is a free agent and has not been able to find a home. So on one hand, I guess it's a positive. On the other hand, that's still your number one corner that just went out the door. Their number two corner was Dornay Holmes. Dornay Holmes had a 44 PFF grade. Presumably, that's still their number two. Reason being, they brought in Amani Aruarie, presumably to be their number one. And, and, And to be very clear about this, if these... Two guys are still their number one and number two, and we'll get to the draft in a second. This might be the worst cornerback group in all of football. Because if Amani Aruarie, who had a 30 PFF grade last year, 31 coverage grade, is your number one corner to replace Fabian Moreau, who was better than that, and your number two corner is Dornay Holmes, who had a 44 PFF grade, 49 coverage grade, that is the worst group ever. Now, with that said, um, they do still have Adoree Jackson. Now, I actually think Adoree Jackson is probably going to be their number one, and I think number two is going to be Deontay Banks. Now, Adoree was um, injured last year. He ended the season with a pretty good PFF grade, but again, extremely volatile. About half his games were in the 50s, half of his games were 70s and 80s. But still, I think it's going to be Adoree Jackson, who was a first-round pick, and then in the first round this year, they drafted Deontay Banks out of Maryland. I think that's what they're going to do. It's going to be Deontay Banks and... uh, Adoree Jackson as their top two corners. But even with that, they have no depth. This whole team has no depth, which makes sense because they did nothing to build this roster. They went out and got free agents, ruined and squandered their opportunities in the draft, so they have no core of players. So that has to be built from the ground up. And so as they're building, it's it's just a very hollow roster, right? They've got, even when they have elite players, it drops off so quick. But we'll see. If Deontay Banks can be a really good corner, and, and they got speed. I mean, Deontay is really fast. Adoree Jackson was a 4-4-2 guy, so I mean, they, they, they're not going to say big and fast because Adoree Jackson's actually pretty tiny. There's the potential for at least having two quality corners. More than likely, Adoree Jackson's going to be decent, and everything else is going to be kind of a disaster. Then last year, their number one safety was Julian Love. Julian Love is now gone with the Seahawks. Number two was Xavier McKinney. McKinney, 61 PFF grade, not very good. Number three, Jason Pinnock. Pinnock, whatever. Basically, every single safety graded out in the 60s, with the exception of Dane Benton, who was in the 30s. Terrible safety group. Uh, that includes Landon Collins, who, um, you know, at one point was considered a good football player, especially his first stint with the Giants, but he came back, was injured, played about a third of a season, and they got rid of him, and um, he is a free agent still looking for a home. And unfortunately, weak safety free agency, weak safety draft, they added nobody. So, as we recap the uh, the Giants, as of right now, this is a team that has, I think he was a little harsh on Jones. He ranked 17th via PFF last year. He's not good, but, you know, there are worse quarterbacks. 
mediocre quarterback. Saquon, who has never been able to meet his ceiling. He ranked 15th last year. Horrific offensive line with the exception of one of the best left tackles in football. Very questionable wide receiver group. Again, they brought in Paris Campbell, who ranked 93rd last year. They brought in Jamison Crowder. We'll see where he ranks in all this. PFF doesn't even have him as a starting wide receiver. The best wide receiver they have ranked 25th last year. Then Slayton was 61st, and then again Campbell 93rd. And then you got Waller at tight end. We'll see what he can do. He was the 12th best tight end last year. It's not a terrible group, but there's really nothing elite here. There's a couple good players and one elite tackle. And then defensively, you've got a fairly scary starting defensive front with Thibodeau, Lawrence, Williams, and Ojolari. Zero depth. If there are any injuries, especially to Dexter Lawrence, this this goes from a really scary front to eh. Then at corner, it kind of depends on Banks a little bit and what version of Deontay Jackson you get, but it could be a decent corner group. It could be a terrible corner group. And then they really just don't have much at linebacker or safety. So the defense actually could be formidable. We got to see what Martindale can do. If he can get the best out of this group, it could be pretty stifling. I mean, when you've got, first of all, a stifling front where you can't run the ball and they can rush the passer and they've got corners that can stick with your guys for a little bit. I mean, it doesn't matter if they don't have linebackers or safeties. You know, you've only got a very limited amount of time to throw because the pass rush is getting home and your guys aren't getting open in that very limited window. I mean, it just it just becomes kind of this suffocating thing. I remember even Aaron Rodgers struggling with those types of, of uh, situations, even in premier years, where it's like, man, we just can't seem to get something going here. With that said, I, I don't I don't think it's going to be that elite of a defense, and I definitely think this this um, this offense, especially when I look at Rashawn Gary against Evan Neal, who ranked 80th out of 81 tackles, and then you got our interior up against a very weak interior and a rookie center. Um, Every reason to believe that we can make this hell for their offense. So anyways, why don't we take a quick break? Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddies where you can support the podcast for as little as $1 per month. Please remember to support the Patreon that I have pinned to the top of my Twitter as well as Packing a Podcast Facebook group. And please do me a favor and check out FertileGroundRanch.org. See if that is a ministry that you'd be interesting interested in supporting. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details All right, so we're coming off a win on the road against the New York Giants on a Monday night prime time game. Congratulations, well done, everybody. Then Sunday, December 17th, the Green Bay Packers come home to face the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Noon game in Lambeau Field doesn't get a bit better than that. Probably a little bit of snow on the ground, which is obviously fantastic when you're talking about a warm weather team. But last year, we had the 2022 Tampa Bay Buccaneers head coached by Todd Bowles. 
Uh, they had an 8-9 and nine record with offensive coordinator Byron Leftwich, defensive coordinators Larry Foote, and Casey Rogers. No real big start and finish uh, things to observe. They started off 5-5, five and five, ended 8-9. Uh, and nine. Did actually sneak into the playoffs, obviously not being worthy of being called a playoff team. They faced the Dallas Cowboys and got completely smashed 31-14. to Their defense ranked 13th, their offense ranked 25th. That's just based on points. Um, their offense was 32nd in rushing, so they're really, really bad at that. 19th uh, defensively against the run. So that's where they struggled the most, although they were um, also 19th in passing, which isn't great. Which is the reason why... They brought in a new offensive coordinator. So Casey Rogers stays the defensive coordinator. Todd Bowles is still going into year two as the head coach. But Dave Canales, Seattle quarterback's coach, is going to come in. Uh, (laughs) The guy spends one year making somebody that everybody thought was a bad quarterback look like a good quarterback. And so, listen, I don't like when stuff like this happens because I think it, it seems like shallow thinking to me. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they have these super secret insights that are like, man, he really did an amazing job. I really think it's just kind of laziness. I think Gino, I mean, honestly, if you look back at Gino, his PFF grades and stuff, they're not actually that bad. He just never really had that much time. And then even this past year, it wasn't even necessarily that good. I mean, it was a 79, which is fine. And really most of that is propped up by three games in the nineties. Um, if you look at Gino Smith, Starting in week nine, you know what his PFF grades were? 65, 65, 60, 72, 55, 65, 73, 63, 53, 63. He didn't really do anything miraculous at all from week nine on. But he had three elite games, a 91 against the Giants, 91 against New Orleans, 91 against Detroit. He also week one had an 84. But aside from that, he didn't really do anything. And and the fact that... so So number one, the idea that he is... He went from being a garbage quarterback to an elite quarterback, which is not necessarily true. And then the idea that it was all Dave Canellis that did it. And as a result of that, that he is such a genius with Geno Smith, that that would mean he's going to be a great offensive coordinator, which is not true. It's it's all just so stupid to me. It really is. But who knows? Maybe he's a brilliant mastermind and he would have gotten the job even if it wasn't for what happened with Geno Smith. But you know what? I think we all know that's BS. But that's fine. That's fine, because I want them to do stupid things, because we're going to face them, and I want them to suck really bad. So, um, Tom Brady, with his final season, went 8-9, and nine. And, and I think probably this regression has a lot to do with that. So Tampa's in a very similar situation to Green Bay. They're like, look, if you were 8-9 and nine with Tom Brady, you're going to be no more than 6.5 without him. And... Tampa Bay Buccaneers fans are probably saying something similar to what we're saying, which is, did you freaking watch Tom Brady last year? Hilariously, if you look at PFF grade, Aaron Rodgers ranked 15th, but he was actually tied for 15th. Do you know who he tied with? Tom Brady. (laughs) They both had exactly a 77.5 PFF grade. Um, If you look at their passing grades, he was actually 8th, where Rodgers was 11th, but still... Not what either side is used to. And unfortunately, while the Packers at least have a shred of hope with Jordan Love, despite the fact that nobody actually believes they have any hope, um, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are rocking with Baker Mayfield. Now, again, I, I, I don't exactly know what happened to Baker Mayfield. Maybe I'm the only one that remembers this. As a rookie, he had an 83.2 PFF grade. Then 75 in year two, which is a step back, but still decent. And then in 2020, he had an 85.7, basically 86. He was the eighth highest graded quarterback in football. And then he dropped off to 30th in 2021, and then 37th out of 39 last year. So I, I, I don't know why he completely fell off. I know he has the potential to be a top 10 quarterback. I know it's assumed we'll never see that again, and maybe that's true. I, I, I don't understand exactly what happened to him. But I also think it's not impossible that he could be kind of competent. I mean, last year he kind of got thrust into a situation last second, and it's a garbage situation. Now he's got, you know, Godwin and Evans and, well, I mean, I guess that's it. They don't have an offensive line or tight end or running back or anything. I don't know. Anyways, I I get it, but I also think they're in a little bit of a 
you know, Aaron Rodgers to love situation where it's like, oh, you lost a Hall of Famer, you're going to completely fall off. But anyways, let me read this little snippet here. Kind of funny, and it reminds me very much of Bears fans. But it says, just a few days before the 2022 NFL season ended, Byron Leftwich shared a quote that just about summed up the season for Tampa. Quote, I know it looked bad to everybody, but I think we were the 12th best offense in the league. Ain't that something? We still have a long way to go. 12th best offense? I wonder what he came up with uh, to find that metric. The Bucks ranked 22nd in EPA per play. They ranked 25th in yards per play. Um, what was he referring to? He wasn't referring to points, right? No, they ranked 25th in points. So what was he talking about? And there it was, total yards per game. That's right, if you're old enough, before the internet, you would open up what was called a newspaper. You would leaf to the sports section, you would flip to the final page or two, and printed there would be the NFL standings. They would list only a few columns of information, wins, losses, ties, points scored, points allowed, offensive yards per game, yards allowed per game, that was the extent of it. And yet here we are, we had just turned the calendar to 2023, and we had an offensive coordinator patting his team on the back for ranking above average in total yards. The very least bit of context you might want to add to that to determine if you were efficient at all would be to factor in per play, yards per play rather than total yards. If he did that, the Bucks would have ranked 25th and not 12th. He's also got a column here with some further context. I haven't done that for a lot of the other teams, but given what we're talking about, let's look at some of these things for offensive efficiency per drive. Points per drive, they were 26th. Touchdowns per drive, 27th. Uh, turnovers per drive, they were 10th. Punts per drive, 22nd. Three and out uh, percentage, 24th. Red zone drive percentage, 22nd. Yards per drive, 21st. I still don't, oh, what is that? Down set conversion rate. Percentage of first downs converted into another first down or touchdown, whatever. They ranked 20th. On first downs since week 9, Tampa Bay ranked 31st when running, 13th when passing. On and on and on. It's just a big, fat disaster. He says, does Byron Leftwich see what everyone else on planet Earth can see? The answer was no. Anyways, in addition to that, they also are losing quite a few players. Obviously, Tom Brady being the biggest of that group. But they lost 22 players. They include Tom Brady... Shaq Mason, right guard, which, you know, we'll get to some of the additions and whatnot, but as I said, they have a terrible offensive line right now. They lost Akeem Hicks along the defensive line, which, you know, Akeem Hicks is a little bit over the hill, there's no doubt about that, but that still sucks. If nothing else, you've got a mediocre player with a massive amount of experience. They lost Leonard Fournette. They lost Julio Jones. Again, backside of his career, not what he used to be. That still kind of sucks. They lost William Golston along the defensive line. They lost tight end Cameron Brait. They lost Raheem Nunez Rochez to the Giants, another defensive lineman. They lost kicker Ryan Suckup. They lost corner Sean Murphy Bunting to the Titans. That's kind of a bad deal. They lost left tackle Donovan Smith, which is massive to the Chiefs. They still have Tristan Wirfs, who is one of the best right tackles in football. They're moving him to left tackle. If he drops off a little bit because he moved to left, this is beyond devastating. They lost safety Mike Edwards, safety Keanu Neal, tight end Kyle Rudolph, quarterback Blaine Gabbert, left tackle Josh Wells, running back Giovanni Bernard, wide receiver Scott Miller. I can't believe I'm all the way down to the bottom. Usually you get up through about four guys and it's like, nobody even knows who these people are anymore, but I'll keep reading it. Dude, I'm, I'm all the way down to about number 20 and, and I'm at Carl Nassib off the edge. That's a big deal. Rashad Perriman, wide receiver. Logan Ryan, cornerback, and Gennard Avery, linebacker. Every single one of these guys, at least at some point, was kind of a big deal. That's 22 competent individuals, all gone. They added quarterback Baker Mayfield, who was going to be their starting quarterback. They added defensive lineman Greg Gaines to try to uh, compensate for any of that. Doesn't look like he's even going to be a starter, number one or number two. They added left guard Matt Feeler to try to fix the offense a little bit, the offensive line. He's really not good. He ranked 61st out of 77 last year. They added running back Chase Edmonds, who gives a crap. They did add Ryan Neal at safety, which if you look at what he did last year in the, you know, three quarters of a year he played, he actually ranked as the fourth best safety in football, which is weird because it's like, I never even heard of this dude. Who is this guy? Well, he was an undrafted free agent in 2018, didn't take his first snaps until 2020 when he had a 56 grade, the next year a 59 grade, and then all of a sudden he's the fourth best. This is what I call fool's gold, which is to say, if he's able to be a top five safety again, I'll eat my freaking foot. Then they brought in kicker Chase McLaughlin to replace the kicker that they got rid of, and another backup quarterback, John Wolford. Then in the draft, they added defensive tackle Kalijah Kansi, 
Second round offensive guard, Cody Mock. I think that's how you say his name. Then pass rusher, Yaya Diaby. Linebacker in the fifth round now, Servocia Dennis. Never even heard of the guy. They had a tight end, Payne Durham. Cornerback, Josh Hayes. Wide receiver, Trey Palmer. And then linebacker, again, Jose Ramirez. So, I mean, this team is somewhat of a disaster. As far as really good football players, they have Tristan Wirfs. He has been, I, I'm pretty sure, a right tackle his entire career. I could look at it, but I'm not really interested. He got moved to left tackle. Their entire offensive line, with the exception of a question mark because of a second-round guard that they got, is a complete freaking disaster. Luke Gadecki at right tackle is a disaster. Ryan Jensen at center is a disaster. Matt Feeler at left guard, I mean, he's had some good years. Last year was a disaster, we'll see. Baker at quarterback. Last year, disaster. Running, I mean, this team has never been able to run the ball, so I, I doubt that's going to be a thing. Even Maybe they're going to try to lean on it, I don't know. Kate Otten is their tight end. He was a disaster. Uh, their their number one wide receiver last year was Godwin, who ranked 26th. Evans, 20, 28th, which isn't bad because you've got two number ones, but you also don't have like an actual good number one. You've got two low-end number ones. And then the defense, I mean, they've got... Um, What's his name? Uh, Levante David. Fantastic linebacker, but the dude is 33 years old. And then you've got safety Antoine Winfield, who's a really good safety. Otherwise, there's not a ton here to massively fall in love with. Shaq Barrett always has a ton of really... uh, He gets a lot of stats, but he never really grades out all that well, which, as we talked about before, probably means high volatility. He's either getting a pressure or he's just getting blown off the ball. But, you know, look, a lot of teams, you can at least see the vision for being a good team. I'm struggling with Tampa Bay. You can almost, almost get there, but not really. You, you kind of got to lean a little bit hard on the imagination, right? Baker Mayfield needs to get back to 2020 Baker Mayfield. Then he's got two wide receivers he can lean on. The offensive line is just, it's not good, and it's not going to be good. You know, Wirfs can still be good. Feeler maybe can kind of get back to what he was. And then Cody Mock, the right guard, can can be a good rookie. You still have two pretty terrible offensive linemen, including your right tackle. Um, Kate Otten, the tight end, could take a step. And then defensively, I mean, I, I did forget to mention Jamel Dean, who's a good corner. But, I mean, I don't know, man. I mean, Kalijah Kansi is a rookie defensive tackle. If you want to believe that he's going to be the first rookie defensive tackle to do anything in the last three years, uh, you know, one of maybe two in the last five years, then fine, they've got one guy. And as I said, Barrett, who, you know, can kind of get stats. But it's, I, I, th- I just think they have a low ceiling and a low floor. They could, of course, hit their ceiling, which would put them above their expectation of 6.5 wins. They can go get eight wins again. But I do think they have a low ceiling. And again, I, I, an extremely low floor if everybody just, if, if Baker plays like he did last year and he doesn't have an offensive line, I mean, it's just, it's freaking game over. So this is one that, you know, and, and again, warm weather team coming to Lambeau in December. Our young, inexperienced team has really spent a lot of time together now. If there's any game on this schedule that I'm circling and putting a W next to, it's this one. I mean, even when you compare it to the Bears, you know, you look at it and go, man, what if Fields just kind of runs all over the place? You know how much we str- we've struggled with that since forever, since Donovan freaking McNabb. Packers always struggle with mobile quarterbacks. I mean, if our offense isn't doing super great, and I mean, he could just break free and run for a touchdown, and maybe he improves as a passer, you know, you can kind of get there. Tampa, though, they don't have that. So, eh, this is one we got to win. And then finally... Our third to last game, Sunday, December 24th, the day before Christmas, at the Carolina Panthers, noon on Fox. Obviously, last year, the Carolina Panthers were a massive disaster. Matt Rule came in, a lot of excitement about that. 7-10 was the result. Offensive coordinator Ben McAdoo, defensive coordinator Al Holcomb, and Phil Snow also had Steve Wilkes as their head coach because Matt Rule didn't make it, neither did Al Holcomb, apparently. So, I mean, it's bad when you're firing people midseason. They did kind of pick up the pace a little bit, um, as far as the wins go. They started 1-5. and 1-4 and four is as far as Matt Rule got. Then they made it to 4-8, and eight, which is 3-3. Three and three. 
and then they had a bye week, and then they ended 3-2. and two. So, you know, some improvements there. Hilariously, they never won back-to-back games. They lost two and then won, then lost three and then won, then lost two and then won, and then, then from there on, starting in week 10, it was win, loss, win, bye week, win, loss, win, loss, win. So if you don't count the bye week, then there's your back-to-back wins, Broncos and Seahawks. But they never actually won two weeks in a row. Uh, At the end of the season, yes, I'm using points and whatnot because it's just sitting on this page that I'm looking at. They were 20th in points on offense, 19th in points on defense. And then as far as the coaching staff, it's all brand new. And plenty of reason for optimism, despite this, like, oh, we got this really hot college coordinator coach guy, which never seems to pan out. They went with steady Eddie Frank Reich. I think that's solid. I think Frank did a fantastic job in Indy. A lot of people were pissed that he got fired in Indy because it the perception was it really was not his fault and he was doing a good job. I don't really know. I don't really care. But I think he is a quality coach. He brought in Thomas Brown, who was the Rams assistant head coach last year. So still picking off that McVay tree. We'll see if that pans out. And then Ejiro Avero picking off the Joe Barry tree. Another one that's kind of coming into question about whether we should continue in that direction or not. But brand new head coach, offensive coordinator, and defensive coordinator. The uh, last three years have been a disaster for the Panthers. They won 5-5 five, five, and then 7. They're projected to win 7.5 this year. Kind of a funny start to this little snippet here. It says, they say money can't buy happy- happiness. Apparently, it sure as hell can't buy wins in the NFL either. David Tepper tried and failed miserably with Matt Rule. The rudderless Carolina Panthers spent so much of Dave Tepper's money on previously failed quarterbacks in such a predictable and fruitless manner. Again, these GMs are idiots. The owners are idiots. Everyone's an idiot, and I don't know how everyone can be that stupid. I'm not saying it's a good idea, but I think if you hand some random Joe Schmo a PFF subscription and just say, do the best you can with your personnel decisions, I think they're going to come out ahead of a lot of these guys. It's ridiculous. Tepper was the richest owner in the NFL and bought the Panthers in 2018. Since then, his team has gone 29 and 53. That was the fifth worst record in the NFL. They had zero winning seasons and zero playoff appearances. Midway through his second year on the job, Tepper fired Ron Rivera, a veteran and well-respected NFL lifer. He went in the opposite direction, rolling the dice and an upstart, highly successful college coach in Matt Rule. The problem for the Rule-led Panthers was that Rule believed he had no time to slowly build a winning program which is always a recipe for, for disaster and another reason why owners are garbage. Because a lot of owners, not saying all owners, a lot of owners are not patient. They're not willing to give you three years, four years to build a winning program. You're, you're expected to come in here and take this garbage roster and make them play good. That's it. So that's problem number one. Despite working with college athletes for years, Rule had no interest in a true uh, in the true way to win in the NFL, which is to draft a franchise quarterback, live with a few-year speed bumps, Uh, and ride his inexpensive rookie deal cap hits to win in years three, four, and beyond. During Rule's three-year tenure of 2020, 2021, and 2022, the Panthers had the following draft picks entering each of the draft with the... uh Draft in the first 40 picks, number 6 overall in 2022, number 7 overall in 2020, number 8 overall in 2021, and then 38, 38, and 39 in those same years. That's six top 40 picks in the last three years. For three years, they were just outside of the top five. They could have traded up in any of those years and got virtually any quarterback if they really wanted to. Hell, this year they picked number 9 overall, lower than all three years under rule. If they really were aggressive in prior years and wanted to make something happen for Joe Burrow, Tua Tungavailoa, Justin Herbert, or Trevor Lawrence, they could have swung for the fences. Or Jordan Love, for that matter. Maybe the Bengals or Jaguars wouldn't trade out of the number one overall pick, but the Panthers didn't present an offer too good to pass up. But let's forget trading up. How about sitting pat and drafting a quarterback? In 2020, the Panthers passed up two of this season's starting quarterbacks, Jalen Hurts twice and Jordan Love once. In 2021, the Panthers passed up two more of this season starting quarterbacks, Justin Fields and Mac Jones. In 2022, the Panthers passed up four of the season starting quarterbacks, Kenny Pickett, Desmond Ritter, Brock Purdy, and Sam Howell. Anyways, he's going on his tirade, but this year they did it, right? This year they traded up with the Chicago Bears. Of course, the one year they're desperate to do it is when the Bears have the number one overall pick. Got to give the freaking Bears a package. Couldn't have let them sit and pick some freaking bum defensive tackle. But anyways, let's poke around their roster a little bit. Um, some of the players, the Carolina Panthers lost number one, DJ Moore, which of course is sort of cutting off your nose to spite your face. You have to give away your one 
semi-legit wide receiver. Yeah, I'm going to be spiteful and say, okay, you're one legit receiver so that you can draft a quarterback so that he really doesn't have a super good receiver. Anyways, they also lost defensive lineman Matt Ioannidis. They lost Pat Elflein, their guard. Sam Darnold to the 49ers. Damian Wilson, linebacker. Corey Littleton, linebacker, went to the Texans. Their kicker, Zane Gonzalez, went to the 49ers. Uh, Deontay Foreman, running back, also went to the Bears. Philip Walker, quarterback, went to the Bears. I do like that this completely failed, useless football team, all their players went to the Bears. <laughs> it's just like the Pack or the, the Jets taking all the Packers players that helped contribute to our terrible season. They lost Andre Roberts, wide receiver, Richard Higgins, wide receiver, TJ Carey, cornerback, Justin Burris, safety, Sean Chandler, safety, Miles Hartsfield, corner, Preston Williams, wide receiver, and Justin Lane, cornerback. So they lost all their wide receivers, at least the ones they don't care about. However, they added DJ Chark, who was decent last year, 70 PFF grade, which ranks 45th, which isn't great, but still a 70. It's tolerable. They also added wide receiver Adam Thielen. Again, you know, 65 grade, didn't have his best year in the world, but you're bringing in some veterans for your young guy and some capable players. And on top of that, they still have uh, Terrace Marshall. Terrace Marshall took a big jump from year one to year two. Uh, year one, he ranked like 100th out of 115. This year, he ranked 56. He went from a 53 grade to a 67 grade. So they got a rookie quarterback, young wide receiver to Marshall, two veteran receivers in Chark and Thielen. Miles Sanders at running back is not a terrible situation. They've got Hayden Hurst at tight end, which not as profitable as it had been in the past. He had his one good year in 2019, but, you know, again, a veteran guy who can do some stuff. And then the offensive line, they have Akema Kwanu, who was number six pick last year. He wasn't great. He had a 65 grade, but you're kind of looking for that year two leap, right? Uh, Brady Christensen is going into year three. He kind of went backwards, so he's not looking super great for him. Bradley Bozeman is the center, another guy that it's pretty mediocre. Uh, right guard Austin Corbett is decent. He was the 19th ranked guard. And then Taylor Moten um, took a little bit of a step back last year, but he's a pretty solid offensive lineman. He was in the 70s and 80s for most years. So if we assume Moten kind of gets back to his high 70s, Austin Corbett kind of stays in his high 60s range. Akema Kwanu takes a step in year two. You've got two probably not great offensive linemen and three mid-offensive linemen with the potential to be pretty good offensive linemen. So it has the potential to be a, a relatively good offensive line with a question mark at quarterback and kind of that high floor, decently high ceiling wide receiver group. This might be a disaster. Obviously, if Bryce Young is bad, the offensive line doesn't take any steps whatsoever. And you got guys like Thielen and Chark continuing to regress with Marshall not taking a step. It's a bad offense. They did also add my guy, Jonathan Mingo, in the second round which makes me sad, and I, I really hope, for, for, for my sake, he doesn't end up becoming a great wide receiver because that would just be depressing, especially because, you know, we have to play him. They also did add in the fourth round offensive guard Chandler Zavala out of NC State. Maybe he gets a job, maybe at left guard. Again, Christensen going into year four hasn't really proven much. Is it year four or year three? This is year three. Uh, but again, he, he had a rough rookie season, and then he went backwards in year two. So there's a chance for year four Chandler uh, Zavala to take that spot. The defense, though, is maybe slightly more troubling. Um, Derek Brown took a massive leap in year three. So he was one of my favorite guys. I mean, I, I that year I would have taken him number one. I love Derek Brown. Year one, though, rookie defensive tackle, go figure, 61 grade, he ranked 75th. Year two... He didn't go up much. 64, he ranked 37th. Year three, seventh highest graded defensive tackle with an 85 PFF grade. 78 pass rush, 81 run defense. Just a phenomenal football player. So that dude's scary. Nobody else along the defensive line, including Brian Burns, who uh, the you know anti-Gary, piss-and-moan Packer fans don't seem to want to talk about these days. This dude is bad at football. He's not doing jack. His rookie year, when, you know, remember he had a, a great preseason and then like his first three seasons he had like three sacks and everybody lost their mind i can't believe you got rashawn gary dude had a 63 grade year two it went up to a 77 and then 60 64 have been the last two years horrific run defender then they have um yatur gross matos which is another guy they took a swing at he has been absolutely putrid um and marquise haynes also lives in the 50s so you got three guys in the 50s and 60s and then brown it's a bad defensive front. 
Uh, J.C. Horn is a decent corner. He ranked 29th last year. He was a number eight overall pick. Then it looks like they have Jeremy Chin, who is a safety playing in the slot. He had a 55 PFF grade last year. Then they have Dante Jackson as their other boundary corner. He had a 55 grade also. So really bad. Even if Horn takes a step, you got one corner, and then the other two guys are terrible. And they didn't do anything to improve that. They didn't bring in any free agents. They didn't draft anybody. They only had five draft picks, so that's part of the problem. Um, At least at outside linebacker, they did draft somebody in the third round, DJ Johnson. We'll see if that materializes, but I would doubt it. He's not going to take Brian Burns' spot, despite how bad he is. There's just no way. At linebacker, they do have Shaq Thompson. He's a decent player. Terrible in coverage, but really good run defender. Um, And that's on the opposite side of Frankie Louvu, who's been pretty solid the last two years. Again, terrible in coverage, good run defender. So uh, tight ends, freaking having a field day with those guys. They did do a little bit of work at safety. They went out and spent $7.5 million uh, average per year on Von Bell. He's been a decent, you know, 70-grade guy for the last five years, six years or so. He's 28 years old, um, second-round pick, so he's a decent safety. The other safety that they have is Xavier Woods. Spent a lot of time with uh, Dallas, I believe, and he ranked 55th last year, so he's a starter, but that's about it. They also drafted in the fifth round uh, Jamie or Jamie Robinson. I don't know how you say the guy's name. Not going to matter. So the defense is bad, right? You got one good corner, one good safety, run defending um, linebackers, and one good defensive tackle. Aside from that, you have three terrible defensive linemen, two terrible corners slash safeties, and then one kind of mid safety. And he might even come off the field. I don't know if they go out of their nickel and get into their base if they would have um, Chin go back and play safety. I'm not entirely sure. But, you know, it's a wait-and-see thing, but it's kind of similar to what we have with Tampa Bay, where I just don't see the path to being a great team, right? It's kind of like the Bears in a way where it's like, you know, if the quarterback can be great or, or, you know, kind of be a really good quarterback, you know, with the rushing and the passing, there's a path to the offense being a little scary, But I don't see how the defense gets to be good. I just don't see it. So it's a bad defense regardless. I mean, sometimes defensive coordinators can make, you know, garbage out of of nothing. Could, Could make garbage out of nothing. Make something out of nothing. But I just, I don't see this being in any way a good team. And I, you know, even when you look at the Packers, when you look at the Packers floor, I don't know how the Packers even underperforming don't beat the Panthers. I just don't I just don't see that. We have a better offensive line, we have better wide receivers, I would assume better tight ends, better running back. Quarterback of course is a question across the board. We have much better pass rushers, maybe they have a better defensive line if you just look at Brown. We have better corners, arguably better linebackers considering our guys are significantly better in coverage, they can run defend better, but that's less important. Uh they have better safeties and that's about it, which is kind of exactly how I talk about us compared to the Bears. Like, we're better, we're better, we're better, we're better, we're better. Oh, and they have better safeties. So anyways, that's how that ends before we get into Minnesota and Chicago, which is not a terrible situation, right? We got a rough game against the Kansas City Chiefs. We can assume that we lose that game. We don't have to assume that, but it's, you know, obviously we're not going to be favored and for good reason. But we've got three very winnable games in a row. And, you know, one of them being a primetime game. So you, you spank the Giants on the road, Monday night in front of the entire world. That would be fantastic. Then you come back home. You, you A snowy, wintry uh, December game against a warm weather team, and you beat the living crap out of them. So now you won two games. Then you go on the road against the Carolina Panthers. You stomp them out. You got a three-game winning streak. You go up against the Minnesota Vikings, who probably are going to be struggling to some degree. I'm guessing there's going to be an NFC North competition. It might even be a three-way competition. And we've got Minnesota coming up. That is a uh, Sunday night game. And then you're going to end the season with the Chicago Bears, hopefully on a very high note, where the terrible Chicago Bears and a completely defeated and crushed Chicago Bears fan base watches as the Green Bay Packers come strolling back home and and the Bears have to come into our territory just to watch something happen that they can't stop. Sure wouldn't be the worst thing in the world for the Packers to end 5-0 and to end this thing and get into the playoffs. Wouldn't that be glorious? I mean, honestly, out of the last five games, the only one that's slightly scary maybe the Giants and the Minnesota Vikings. I, I, I mean, you know, again, you never know. But the Bears, the Panthers, and the Buccaneers should be terrible teams this year. Even Bears fans 
don't expect to be much beyond a seven-win team. And they're wildly, overly optimistic. So, anyways, I'm going to leave it at that. You guys have a great rest of your day. I will talk to you tonight, tomorrow, whatever. Have a good one. Bye-bye.